Good evening, I'm Mark McAdam and welcome to everyone joining us for the EFL's first ever LGBTQ plus fans forum live from our studios here in London. As you all know, we are in the middle of the Rainbow Laces campaign with Rainbow Laces Day itself coming this Wednesday. We have an excellent 90 minutes lined up for you where you will hear from some industry representatives about their experiences and how we can collectively improve LGBTQ plus inclusion within the sport we all love. This is the EFL's LGBTQ plus fans forum. So welcome along to this special program as a part of the Rainbow Laces campaign. Now we'd love you to get involved wherever you are watching us this evening. So please do use the chat function and you can also ask questions at any time using the Q&A button. Uh, we really, really would like to hear your views as well this evening. So make sure you get in touch. First up on our panel tonight, we have one of the EFL's newest signings, David McArdle, who has joined as head of equality, diversity and inclusion from the Scottish Football Association. Uh, thank you, David, for joining us right here in the heart of London. It does look incredible when you look out the window. Um, how important is it to be here and to celebrate and, of course, have the EFL's Rainbow Lace campaign on their agenda? Yeah, well, Mark, first and foremost, thanks very much for having me and thank you very much for hosting this vital event which is taking place tonight. It's vital that the EFL look at this area of the game. We have, for so many years, supported the Rainbow Laces campaign and now it's all about taking the next step. We don't want to just use this as a celebration. We want to use it as an opportunity to, to, to engage with the community to find out what they want to happen to allow us to take this to the next step. Now, some of our clubs and all of our clubs have done so much for so many years and some fantastic initiatives that we'll find out more about tonight, but it's all about what can we use this event to take that forward, to go the next step on our journey and using this as a real focal point for the EFL to take the next opportunity to listen, to, to speak and have that chance to move forward. Now, David, you've only been in the job for a month. We will be speaking to you in a lot more detail throughout the course of the season, uh, this evening. Thank you so much so far. Uh, as you mentioned, a part of tonight is all about the, the opportunity to celebrate the progress that has already been made. Let's take a look at some of that success right now. Some truly inspirational examples there of LGBTQ plus inclusivity within the EFL. Let's bring in now some of those people behind what we've been watching just there. And I'm delighted to say we've got two people in the studio and someone joining us virtually on cue there. Sarah Curtin from the Proud Baggies. Great to see you there. Give us a wave. There Hello. she is, primed and ready to go. And in the studio, we've got Catherine Thomas from the uh, Swansea City Football Club, who is head of fan engagement, and James Laley from the Proud Blades, which is fantastic to see you up here as well. Let's go back virtually, first of all, to Sarah. Um, you've had a, a really positive start to your Rainbow Laces campaign with your activation against Nottingham Forest, which was one of the games to kick off this year's campaign. Just tell us a little bit about it and how successful it was. Yeah, we had a fantastic night up at the Hawthorns. It was very snowy, but beyond that, we had a lovely time. We had rainbow corner flags, 
all the players were wearing our rainbow t-shirts and that is such a important moment I think for us as a fan support group but also for our fans to see our players supporting us obviously some advances in boots means not everyone can wear the laces but we could see the laces dotted around in the ground and we also had some uh, rainbow towels so uh, you'll know that uh, one of our players furlong does a mean throw in and so we got some rainbow towels for him to to dry off that ball and, and hopefully get us a goal uh, I think what's so fantastic about it and and what's so important about it is that that visibility in the ground and that ability for fans to see that football is for everyone just grows year on year out it used to be something that seemed a little bit of a novelty and it's starting to be something people are used to and i can't not mention that we also had our rainbow laces game yesterday with west bromwich albion women and so actually some of the work we're doing across not just men's football but women's football on the anniversary of 100 years since women's football have been banned it's such an important thing that we do across the family of football Sarah, tell us a little bit about the, the, the way it was received by the fans that came to the Hawthorns, because as you've touched upon there, there was, there was so much activity in the programmes, yeah. on the video screens, uh, in the concourses, on the TV screens. So what was the reaction? What was it, what was it received like? The vast majority, I mean, I say the vast majority, 100% of the contact we had this year was positive from people sharing images. I think, you know, we activate and we produce things and the club produces a lot of things, but there's so much fan produced material from LGBT fans, but also allies, people who do things allied to the club on Twitter, changing their images to have rainbows in it, to uh, people getting in touch. Sarah, one, our, our vice chair, wrote a piece in the programme and we had people coming to look for her on the, on the night saying they wanted to say how good it was. And so the reception is, is one of kind of embracing fellow fans, educating a little bit and starting to have those conversations with the fan group about why it matters and, and why we do this every year and indeed why we do this every day of the year being an active fan group. Fantastic. Sarah, do not go anywhere. We are going to come back to you throughout the course of the next 10, 15 minutes or so. But let's uh, bring it back to the studio now, Catherine. Um, you, you hear about the work that um, the Proud Baggies have done uh, and you've got your own game coming up, funny enough, against Nottingham Forest. Forest as well. <laughs> uh, what, what sorts of things can we expect from the Proud Swans? Um, so quite similar to what Sarah was just highlighted there. So the, the usuals of the... Um, We'll have the LED screens and we'll have the big screens, we'll have the captain armbands. Um, but something that we've developed unique with our uh, supporter group called the Proud Swans uh, for our game is we're launching an LGBTQ plus range in our club shops. We've got an exclusive event the evening before. We've closed off the club shop just for our Proud Swans and their members to come down. And like Sarah said, it's uh, bringing in our female players as well. So we've got a representative of our lady players actually being involved in that too. So they're coming down to support that. Um, so we'll be uh, changing the window display and we'll be launching that for that specific game then. And in between, um, we had a game uh, a couple of weeks ago and we've been running an inclusivity survey as well to all our supporters to really get under the skin of our supporters, to really know what makes up our demographics, to firstly know how we can support it. So we'll be pushing that survey throughout the, the course of our Rainbow Laces campaign as well. Tell me a little bit more about this merchandise range because that seems quite exciting. Yeah, it is. So we, uh, we, it actually came about from uh, Karis from our Proud Swans, who leads on our Proud Swans from us. She joined us on a fans forum at the end of last season. And one of the questions she put to the panel, which was um, to our chief executive, Julian Winter, and to our senior management team, was that they, they felt it would be quite important for them to have more visibility. Um, and one of the things that they thought would really help that would be have a pride range. So on the spot, the, the club committed to saying, absolutely, why wouldn't we do that? So we launched back in Pride Month in June. Um, the only thing we could get quickly in at that time to launch was actually a rainbow llama. Um, <laughs> and, but it went on really well. Um, yeah, why not? Exactly. And it sold out. Uh, so we've been working in consultation um, ever since that period. So we've got a range of different things coming out. So we've got scarves, key rings, um, lanyards. We've got softballs to hopefully then start those, those lovely conversations to take place in schools as well. Um, and we've also got a Proud Swans uh, badge that people can purchase and then they can have that affixed to their home or way tops as well for visibility, not just at the Rainbow Laces campaign, but throughout the whole season. I was going to say, that's, that's key, isn't it? It's not yes. just about uh, this activation period. It's about throughout the course of the season, letting, know, letting the LGBTQ fans know that they are welcome at all times, not just for specific games. Uh, yes. And that's great to see. I can't wait to see some of that merchandise. Uh, James um, from the Rainbow Blaze, which is, of course, associated with Sheffield United. Tell us a little bit about your journey and how you've come to sit here today. 
Yeah, well, Rainbow Blades uh, was founded in April 2020, so about a year and a half ago. Uh, we've come on leaps and bounds since we were founded back back in April 2020. We've now uh, just surpassed 300 members, which is absolutely fantastic. We've got a committee. Uh, you know, we've got pin badges. I've littered with pin badges tonight. <laughs> uh, um, and we've got amazing dialogue with our community foundation, but also with the club, which is vitally important. I think all three of us working together, that's why we've managed to achieve so much in such a short space of time. And you were talking about obviously a fan forum. We had a Rainbow Blaze fan forum a few weeks ago at the club. Again, heads of department around the table. Our CEO, Stephen Bettis was there. And we had members in person and via Zoom, you know, posing all sorts of different questions around equality, diversity, inclusion. And Rainbow Range also came up and we're also launching a Rainbow Range in, in the coming weeks as well, which is fantastic. And we've just got so much coming up for our Rainbow Laces match day, uh, which is a week today against QPR. Fantastic. And it's still quite relatively new in terms of the, the Rainbow Blades. How receptive were the football club when you approached them and said, look, we need to set up an LGBTQ plus supporters association. Mm -hmm. It's something that a lot of clubs are doing now. And, and I think it's vital for us. Were they yeah. on board immediately? Yeah, I, I guess it sounds biased, but because it's my club, but they were absolutely amazing. They were so receptive and they were like, yes, of course, of course, we want to support you. Of course, we want an LGBTQ plus supporters group. Why wouldn't we? And through that and through, it's, it's very much, um, you know, a two way street. So I will go to them with lots of ideas, but they also have lots of ideas as well. So for example, one of the ideas that's gonna be happening this week that we're going to uh, publish across social media on Sunday is I'm meeting the men's team, the women's team, and the academy teams to talk about Rainbow Blaze, to talk about LGBTQ plus inclusion, and how all of them can also be allies, proud allies, and that's gonna be packaged together into a snazzy video, I'm sure, which will go out on social media. So. Uh, and, and that was the club's idea. That wasn't our idea as Rainbow Blaze. That was the club's idea. So it's, it's, it's bringing all those ideas to the table, having that passion, having that enthusiasm and all working towards the same goal. Excuse the pun. Absolutely. No, <laughs> it's fantastic to hear the, how receptive the football club uh, have been. Sarah, in terms of the work that you've done with, with Proud Baggies, how, how sort of much do you learn from other football clubs and their LGBTQ plus supporters groups? Because you can all sort of steal ideas and work together. It's not just your individual club and that's all you think about. There's a collective that work together, isn't there? Oh yeah, it's enormous. I mean, obviously pandemic aside, Previously, we've had in-person meetups with the, the other supporters groups. We do a lot of work with Pride in Football. There's all manner of ways that different LGBT supporters groups are working together. And I think, you know, when we look at clubs like West Bromwich Albion, we have a bigger team. We've had it established a little bit longer. We have a real responsibility to work across football and work with across the EFL to support anyone who wants to set up a supporters group. And I know from anyone I've spoken to at any of the clubs, if anyone gets in touch from different teams, more than happy to help set it up because we have to be a community and we borrow so much from each other and we learn so much from each other's ideas and football happens as a community. It's not just one club. It's not just in one city or one place. Absolutely. And in terms of sort of moving this forward, Catherine, what, what can clubs do to make those match day experiences more inclusive? Um, I think it all just starts with uh, listening to the supporters first and foremost. Um, we, we're very much guided on what, what they say is high on their agenda. Um, so one of the things that they came to us first of all and said that they wanted to see us put in place is to put a, a tech service so that they can report any discriminatory behaviour. And we quickly turned that round and we launched it two, two games ago. Um, and again, we've done that in collaboration with our support groups, um, not just LGBTQ+, but also some other support groups that we work with as well. Because again, um, as Sarah says, it's, it's the meshing of um, the, the clubs all work together, the support groups are working together, um, and everybody's wanting it for the same objective. Everyone wants to create this and foster this really inclusive, welcoming environment. Um, and that's something we just want to see. I read a stat on the, on the, on the train on the way up from Stonewalls, 
and he said 43% of people in the LGBTQ plus community still don't feel welcome in football. Now that stat was from 2017. So I'd love to see the same survey and know what that stat is now, because I think I would pray and hope that we have moved on leaps and bounds and that percentage would be really low. Mm -hmm. And it'd be great to see in another five years time, I mean, to get that down to as close to zero as we possibly can. I mean, that's the overall goal. Absolutely, Sarah's nodding. Uh, James is also <laughs> nodding at that as well. And, and like you say, that statistic from 2017 yeah. without question would have changed because yes. it, it really feels like, James, so much progress has been made, particularly in the last three or four years. Yeah, you look at what, what the Rainbow Laces campaign if, uh, specifically was doing, you know, three, four years ago and to what it's doing now, the amount of clubs that are involved, all the Premier League clubs and the EFL clubs, the amount of support groups. I think when, when Rainbow Blaze was founded, a year and a half ago, I think there might have been around 50 LGBTQ plus supporter groups. Now there's well over 60. It just keeps growing and growing and growing. And what I think is really, really nice as well is you're seeing a lot of LGBTQ plus supporter groups from uh, kind of lower league clubs as well coming into fruition. And that's absolutely amazing. And they also need the support as well. And that's where we can share our best practices to say, well, this is this is what worked at Proud Swans. This is what worked at Rainbow Blaze. Maybe try that with with your group. And yeah, it's it's really heartwarming uh, to see, you know, how much progress has been made and it's only going to get better. Absolutely. And just very quickly before we finish this little section of tonight's show, um, what can people do to become allies? What can people do on a match day to make the LGBTQ plus community feel more included? From, just from my sort of perspective, um, I know we work a lot with uh, the Proud Swans and they say about visibility is key for them. So even them just being able to display their flag at the stadium just to show um, to show that they're there and they've got a presence that just attracts new members in itself. Um, but it also shows um, ambassadors of the club and then ambassadors who um, they've felt confident in approaching to become ambassadors of the Proud Swans as well and that affiliation and just ties it all together. Um, and as uh, we were talking in the green room beforehand, you know, it's it's not just about football. It's not just that 90 minutes. It's what happens afterwards. It's it's your place in the community as well. So it's not just about Swansea City. It's the city of Swansea as well. So um, having that display for that 90 minutes where it's, it's across all channels, all on social media, it just gets ambassadors for the LGBTQ plus community on a wider remit. Yeah, yeah. We, um, we launched our Proud Allies initiative uh, back in June 2020 and our membership is 55% LGBTQ plus and 45% allies which I think is an amazing thing because you know we can't do it on our own we do need allies to amplify our voice and they can do you know through the Proud Allies initiative we've got the Proud Allies pin badge by wearing that pin badge even just that alone is, is a symbol and it shows to us as LGBTQ plus blades you stand with us. Absolutely. And we'll be talking a little bit about the community uh, later in today's show. And just finally from you, Sarah, virtually, which is something we've all become used to over the course of the last 18 months or so. When you when you hear about, you know, the campaigns that uh, James and Catherine have been going through and you see the work that's being done and, and, and just that statistic there, that 45 percent of the Rainbow Blades are uh, straight heterosexual people. That, that gives you an indication as to how many allies there are that want to support this campaign and want to push things forward and want to enforce change. It, it must make you really proud and excited about the future. Oh, I mean, absolutely. I'm proud and excited about the future of football, right? We're a community that look after each other, take care of each other. We share, for us, we share an identity as all being Albion. And I think there's something so powerful about bringing in allyship, not just for LGBT fans, but women at the ground, the stuff that we've seen with players taking the knee that is rooted through our community of football and rooted to say that if we share this identity in common, then the things that we might not share in common, we can still be a family and we can still be a community together. Sarah, that sounds fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. Great to see you on the big screen in the studio here. Catherine and James as well. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really interesting to hear some of their points there. Uh, let's take a look now at how Rainbow Laces has been looking in action.
Great to see the Rainbow Laces campaign in action. And I am now joined by Dan White, who is the chief executive of Bristol City Robins Foundation, and Lou Brackpool, who is the head of participation and community engagement at the EFL. Great to see you both. Thank you so much for your time. It looks pretty spectacular out there, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Very nice London landscape. Absolutely. We, we, we couldn't get anything less for you two. Um, Dan, let, let's talk about um, the work that's being done uh, and how important it is, particularly at foundation level. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's there's foundations that with DFL, there's a national network of CCOs that are out there doing some great work in the community. And for us down at Bristol City, we're working in partnership with Bristol City Panthers, um, who are an LGBTQ plus friendly football team, um, effectively making a safe space for the LGBTQ plus community um, to enjoy the game they love. Um, and, and we as a, a foundation attached to a football club have a huge responsibility to 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 make that space accessible um, and, and yeah. And, yeah, open to everyone to enjoy the beautiful game. And that's one of the great things about Bristol. I've, I've been there a number of times and you do get a real sense of community because there are so many sporting organisations all linked to the stadium uh, and to the work that's been done there. And, and that must be great for you to be able to tap into all of these resources and all of these different sports and bring together different communities to create an even better community, particularly for the LGBTQ+. Yeah, certainly. Uh, we're very lucky as part of the Bristol Sport Group to be uh, in there with the Bristol Bears Community Foundation for, as, as a charity of the Rugby Foundation um, and also Bristol Flyers and, and their community side as well. Um, so, yeah, we, we work together on, and, and I think you'll have seen in, in the previous weeks, um, out the Bristol Bears held their LGBTQ plus rainbow laces fixture. And as have we done uh, a similar uh, with, the, with the game against Derby earlier, oh, last weekend or this weekend, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and Lou, you work with the EFL Trust. Uh, and of course, you would be directly in communication with, with Dan and his team and, and, and so many other groups up and down the country about the work that they do. Just tell us a little bit about your role and, and how it works. Sure. Well, you know, at, at the Trust, we're obviously working with the 72 trusts who are across the, the EFL network. Um, and what we're really trying to do is, is support them as much as possible um, in my role, particularly right, right the way across the equality, diversity and inclusion um, agenda, but really helping them to make, as Dan was saying, those environments which are not just safe, but are really positively welcoming to sort of like, you know, a range of diverse groups, but obviously at the moment focusing on the LGBTQ plus community. So we... Yes, we work with them as much as we can. Um, we encourage them to, you know, develop their staff. You know, that's that's a key part of it, that they've got the staff who are understanding and appreciative of, of the situations that people are going through. Um, so we do webinars. We've worked actually this work uh, this week with Charlton Athletic Community Trust, um, you know, who are very progressive in this area to do webinars on um, transgender, on um, terminology, uh, you know, and to, to really develop that, continuous professional development for, for staff across the network. Um, but just keep everybody up to date as much as we can, give them the support that they feel comfortable that when they're trying to create these safe environments that you know, we, we can help them share good practice from, um, you know, from Robbins Foundation, Charlton and, and others. Um, and also, you know, doing the whole raising awareness, you know, we really push the social media and just make sure that people are understanding what we're doing and why we're doing it. And one of the things that people always seem to, to say that makes a huge difference when it comes to talking about these issues and, and trying to enforce changes is education. And presumably that's a big part of what the EFL Trust do as well. Definitely. And I think, you know, if we're honest, everybody struggles sometimes. You know, are we saying the right things? Um, you know, you don't want, people don't want to offend people. But I think more and more we're seeing in this space that people are prepared to, to ask questions um, and, and that's you know, why we do the webinars, why we do, you know, through our communities of practice, that it's, it's, a, it's a safe place for people to ask those questions and to make sure that, you know, they're, they're not going in sort of like unprepared. So, yeah, education, you know, A, for the staff, but also for our participants, you know, anybody who's participating in a community activity at a local level, you know, we want them, you know, everybody to feel comfortable with the environment that they're, that they're participating in. Absolutely. Uh, when you look at the work you've done with, with Bristol City, how receptive have the club been? How, how much have they engaged with the work that you've done and, and wanted to do it? And how much have they helped to actually make change themselves? Yeah, I mean, the club have been tremendously supportive. I think you only need to look at the, the Rainbow's Laces fixture that we held against Derby on, on Saturday. Um, we were fortunate enough to, to put some, some video pieces together. We had 
uh, club and ambassador Scott Murray came down to a Bristol City Panthers training session and he does this annually um, to come and meet the guys uh, and sort of yeah get a feel for the session and, and meet, meet the team um, and then on top of that we we did a uh, we used the Stonewall messaging um, and produced a video that went out on social media prior to the game where you had club uh, club chairman club chief execs players from the men's and both and the women's team as well, as well as some foundation staff, um, giving across that key messaging around um, the support of the LGBTQ plus community. So presumably a, a big part of what you do is that, that engagement with the football club and the fans and, and those social media channels. Yeah, no, certainly. I think the biggest thing for us is about building like strong, genuine relationships with people. Um, and that's what we've been able to do with, with the Bristol City Panthers um, with the team and, and the guys there who've been Tremendously, we we have we have supported, but also they've supported us and guided us in terms of how we can yeah pull things together and and we don't just go and run a rainbow laces fixture by ourselves. We engage with them. We say actually, what is the right fit here? Um, getting the, the expertise from those guys. And I guess for you, Lou, one of the the exciting things about your role within the EFL Trust is you get to tap in to all of these fan organisations and, and see all of the work that they're doing individually. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's so inspiring. You know, I've, I've, I've worked in community football for almost 20 years now. I know it's hard when I'm only 35, but, <laughs> but in all genuinely, you know, to, to see th how things have progressed and to see what's going on and how people are sharing and, and taking that on board, it, it really is in inspiring. And, you know, what we are really trying to do is, you know, tackling tackling discrimination right the way across the board doing it together and to see you know the community trust working with their football clubs um, and, and really pushing it and, and year on year seeing more and more of it it's it, it's really it, it's really very exciting and, and great for I think the whole football community fantastic remember you can get in touch as well if you want to send in questions through the social media channels throughout the course of this evening then we will put them to the panel as well uh, some people have been in touch Lou and, and sort of said what what in terms of the the work that has been done how much of it is having an impact and where is the biggest impact what clubs have had big hits within their community um, it Impact. I'm, I'm not going to go into the, like the whole impact. It's, it, it is difficult to say like long term. Um, so I think very much on the uh, on the raising awareness and people feeling comfortable is is where the biggest impact has had. You know, recently, but I mentioned Child and Athletic Trust recently. You know, actually the um, the Invicta team was one of the first LGBT you know clubs to, uh, allied with a professional football club. You know, Robbins Foundation, Bristol City have now followed. Um, but we've got other examples, you know, um, Bolton up in there, they've had a LGBTQ plus youth club since, you know, May 2018. Um, you know, and just seeing that young people are feeling more comfortable, you know, to, to come to that football, community football environment and, and be part of that. Um, and, and just, you know, you could just, it's small steps, obviously, the, the Stonewall, Stonewall Rainbow Laces campaign, you know, you could just see it's, it's gathering momentum. So it's just, you know, I said awareness raising is the biggest one at the moment, but when we are getting, you know, community football teams who are welcoming and are, are having participants from that community, I think that's really where we, you know, make sure that the impact is because, you know, football is everybody's game and nobody should feel left out. You are in constant contact with 72 EFL trusts on a weekly and monthly basis. So you're, you're right at the forefront of, of what they're doing and, and the change that's, that's happening. What is the future for these organisations and, and, and how much can you do to, to enhance the work that they do in the community? Um, that's tough, you know, I can't say I speak to 72 every week, um, but, you know, we, we have the networks, we have regional networks, we do come together as a national network on a re regular basis. Um, and it's really just, you know, continually, I wouldn't say like pushing them, but encouraging them to, to go that one step further. Um, you know, I'd like to say the world's our oyster, you know, we can, but, you know, we, we really just want to make sure that anybody who wants to participate in football, being, being that's playing football, being that's, you know, going to a, a stadium on a Saturday, you know, we just want to make sure that they are, they can do that and, and feel comfortable and, and feel welcome. And I guess you can tap into Lou and, and the, the, the resources and the knowledge and the experience she has within uh, the work that, that she does. What, what can you do? You know, I suppose you, you speak to fan groups and 
and they're almost in competition. It's a friendly competition, but they want to kind of outdo each other by going, right, in the next campaign, we're going to do this. We're going to raise the bar. We're going to try this. We're going to smash a barrier down there where, where it's been before. And in terms of your work moving forward, what, what can you take from what Lou said and, and what can you do to kind of enhance the work that you already do that's already so brilliant? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we do get a lot of support from EFL Trust um, in terms of, yeah, not just this space, but... But, but everything more generally. I think the big thing for me is is it's probably genuine allyship from from individuals within football, within the club, uh, and within the wider group as well. Um, to really championing that message and 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 really, yeah, I guess displaying that actually football is a safe space for people to a come and watch, but b come and play. Because because actually everyone who who typically goes and plays, you look at the Bristol Panthers for example, they're not just Bristol City fans. They're they're fans from across the country that happen to be in Bristol and, and share this this this, this commonality. So um, yeah, it, I guess it's just about really nailing down on that, promoting the the LGBTQ plus um, agenda, and uh, yeah, being a positive role model um, and, and and engaging them in in, in football. Absolutely. Uh, no, fantastic to hear from you both. We've had some questions in. We're going to do a Q&A uh, a bit later on as well. So we will pose some of those questions to you both respectively. But Dan and Lou, thank you so much uh, for taking the time to chat. You will be back in the studio as well. Uh, I must take my hat off to both of you and all of the work that you do. I think we can all take away some learnings from that fantastic work that they've been implementing at their respective individual clubs, uh, fan groups or their foundations. It's absolutely superb to see. I know there are so many others who will be in attendance tonight who have worked so hard to make genuine change. It's very much a collective uh, and a brilliant job done by all of you. Please do get in touch as I say. Uh, we really, really want to hear from you throughout the course of this evening. So there we go, please do get involved on the chat or feel free to ask us some questions via the social media channels. Now I'd like to welcome our next guest, two people I know very well indeed. Jay Lamonius, who is the Diversity and Inclusion Officer at the FA and he's also the captain of Millwall Romans Football Club and Anwar Udin, who is the Fans for Diversity Campaign Manager at the Football Supporters Association. Great to see you. I think Jay, it might be the first time I've seen you not wearing a football kit. Yes. Uh, Normally yes, I'm turning up to games and you're kitted out, suited, you know, you've got your boots on and yeah. you're hot and sweaty and playing football. So it's, it's, this is very different for us. Yeah, um, this is my attempt at dressing smartly. No, so. you look very good indeed. And why <laughs> it's you. always great to see you as well. Some of the work that you do, I'm, I'm in awe of because you are genuinely on the front line uh, making change. Um, Jay, let's start with a little bit about your role uh, and what you do because you've got very different roles within mm. the LGBTQ plus communities. One at, one at the FA and then one Sunday League and, and, and fighting on that front. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, obviously my day job uh, is uh, working at the FA, so first inclusion officer. So uh, ultimately, I guess, supporting on our, um, our, our strategy around diversity inclusion. So whether it's uh, the predecessor, which was uh, In Pursuit of Progress. Uh, we just launched our new strategy, uh, A Game for All. Um, so that's our day-to-day. -day. That's what we ultimately uh, strive for in terms of making uh, football a more inclusive, um, inclusive space. Um, but ultimately, yeah, uh, I, I play football, I coach. Uh, I'm grateful and thankful enough to be uh, a captain of uh, a couple of clubs that I play for. Um, and yeah, so... If I'm not working football, I also play and, and, and work in sort of community groups that uh, are quite close to the LGBT community. And one of the visible images through uh, this summer was Harry Kane, the England captain, wearing a rainbow armband Absolutely. and um, showing his support for the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, and that was something that you were very heavily involved with at the FA. Yeah, absolutely. So I think it was incredibly important for uh, us as an organisation to... Um, be visible in our support, but ultimately empower players to kind of use their platform, use their voice um, to, to again, show that visible uh, allyship that's so necessary and so needed uh, across the game. Um, and yeah, I think even just a small gesture uh, of wearing a cap rainbow captain's armband, um, even 
even though it was outside the, uh, the, the Rainbow Laces campaign period. Um, I don't think you can underestimate how powerful that was, not just to LGBT people, but the message that it sends out to, to other allies or other people who, who might not necessarily know how to act on their allyship. So um, it's a small gesture, but, but ultimately the impact that that could have is, is absolutely huge. I was going to say a small gesture, but a, a massive impact. So, and, and that's the thing about uh, these things when, when big EFL players, big England players get behind these types of campaigns, they can, they can make huge steps forward with their, with their actions and their words. Um, Anwar, let, let's bring you in at this point. You were the, the first British Asian to captain a side in the EFL. You played up and down the footballing pyramid. You, you've coached as well. Uh, and constantly, you're, you're fighting for change. Uh, it just, it just, it's in your heartbeat. It's in your makeup. It's just a part of, of the work you've done, aside from being a very talented footballer. Yeah, most definitely. I had uh, the privilege to play 17 years. I l absolutely loved it and uh, very proud to be one of the first British Asians to do so in this country. Football's given me something I can only dream of. But um, I'm passionate about this because once a year, you know, I'd always be asked, and why can we throw this T-shirt on? It's our fight against discrimination. It's our kick it out day. It's our day that we're going to raise awareness. And I was like, yeah, give me that shirt. I'm going to wear it with pride. But one thing I always wondered was, what about the rest of the year? What about the weekly fight, the monthly fight? And when I retired, I uh, went into coaching at West Ham United, but I just felt that I could do more and I wanted to do more. So I joined the FSA and um, yeah, started the Fans for Diversity campaign, which actually brings fans to the table to say, what can we do? What can you do to create positive change? Because as a player, a lot of the stuff was from the top down. You know, the governing body saying, right, we should do this. Can we try this? I thought it was really powerful to get the fans to have a say in that. What do you think we should do? What ideas do you think will contribute towards positive change? And, you know, some of the fan groups that we see from the LGBTQ plus community, the work that they're doing, the work across the country has been absolutely amazing. I'm just proud that I can play a small part in that. Tell us a little bit more about the role within the FSA and, and the impact that, that, that they've been having. I think sometimes it's just confidence and, and conversation. So, you know, you could get a phone call from a, an individual fan who wants to start an LGBTQ plus fan group but doesn't know where to start. But at the FSA, we are a, a democratic organisation that brings fans together. We've got thousands and thousands of members and we just want to give people the confidence and the support to do whatever it is they want. So whether it is to start a new group, put them in touch with people that have done it before, show them examples of best practice, even connect them to their clubs, which, you know, being, you know, in the EFL or the Premier League, there's some superb work being done by fans, but they don't have that connection with their clubs. And sometimes it's like, have you met your SLO? Have you met your head of EVR at your club? And sometimes just that introduction can create some magical stuff, which is what we've seen. So it's about the kind of under the radar work, supporting fans, supporting, the likes of the EFL to, 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 to do as much as we can because there's so much work that needs to be done, but ultimately we need people to do it. Absolutely. Um, we've been encouraging people throughout the course of this evening to send in questions as well for the Q&A later on, but we have got uh, some questions uh, as well now, Jay. I'm going to pose a couple to you as, as someone who still currently plays football. Uh, this one, I think, perhaps targeted at you from uh, David Stronnell, who says, across the board, we have a greater awareness of LGBTQ+. But what do you think is the biggest blocker for any players to come out publicly? It's a pretty huge question. I think it's uh, a question we hear a lot. Um, uh, I think there are so many other challenges um, uh, that people need to consider. Um, I think sort of coming out, if you ask any LGBT person, is a very personal journey. Um, I think kind of what that journey uh, unfolds like to each of those individuals is um, is valid um, and I think we need to kind of respect that uh, to an extent but um, I think ultimately what we're talking about sometimes are, are athletes who have such a small window of, of a career and, uh, and ultimately uh, sometimes uh, there are cases where they don't want to be uh, the, the gay footballer. They just want to be um, the player who uh, plays right wing for whichever club. Um, I think that's important and then, uh, ultimately that's a crucial part of their identity at that stage in their, in their lives. Um, and I think that's just as valid as anybody that may choose to come out at the end of their career, uh, just before they retire, uh, or even um, if they choose to come out um, to a short uh, or small uh, social circle of people that they might trust. Um, so I think we've just got to respect that and ultimately we can could, we could speculate about who's coming out and, and why people might not come out. But, but ultimately what we need to concentrate on is the environment around these players and, and ensuring that we, we're creating inclusive environments, not just for players, but for, for everybody uh, within the game, whether it's fans, players or, or coaches alike.
I think that's a really important point you've hit on there. These campaigns aren't about getting players to come out. This, this isn't a, a kind of, you know, let's go and find people that can come out and then we can look back and go, our work is done. Mm. It's about creating a safe space, an inclusive place, so that if a player does feel they can come out, then they're going to be loved and accepted for who they are. Uh, but also it's for, for, for those people that are in the stands, those mm. people that watch on the TV, those people that are in environments that they can just feel safe and wanted and loved for being their authentic self. That's, that's key, isn't it? That's what the message ultimately is, Anwar. Yeah, I think for me, it's about being your best self. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm so pleased that now, if you look in the non-league game, you've got out game managers and players that are feeling confident enough to do that. And actually, they've been supported in that journey. So I think it's about creating an environment that is inclusive, creating an environment where people can feel that they can be their best version of themselves. But one thing I would say is that I know speaking to players across the board is they're encouraged by the fact that their club have an LGBTQ plus fan group. They have big banners in their stadium that are there permanently. And this discussion is being had. And I think these small things may seem small in, in when you talk about the grandeur of football or the Premier League or the EFL, but they just might give that person the confidence to say, this is something I can do. And it might mean a young player in an academy who can feel confident enough to do that. However it may be, I think that what we're doing at the moment is really, really good. And I think it is conducive with, with creating a better environment. Yeah, I've had a couple of messages here. Uh, Jenny Hancock has sent one in saying, Cheltenham Town Football Club are launching Proud Robins this weekend at their fixture against Lincoln City. I'm looking forward to working with you all to help make football a more inclusive environment. Thanks very much indeed uh, for that one, Jenny. And a question as well for you, uh, Anwar, from Rob Harris, who says, it's great to see the EFL making a real positive commitment to LGBTQ plus fan groups and equality, but how persuasive can the EFL be with clubs who may be hesitant in setting up groups? Um, Rob says, I am lucky as I set up the Proud Valiance, which is the Charlton Athletic LGBTQ plus group seven years ago, uh, and with the club, the trust and the fans, and it's been great ever since. But we know there are clubs that aren't so lucky. So I guess his point is, how do we encourage those clubs that don't have LGBTQ plus fan groups to, to get these people out and to support them and encourage them and develop them and, and make them feel safe? I think it's a great question. The Proud Valiants have been doing amazing work over the past seven years, and they're a group that I always use as an example of best practice. But the key point is, and it's a challenge for the EFL, is that You've got championship clubs that are formerly of the Premier League, huge stadiums, huge fan bases, but you also go down to League Two, where you might get clubs that are smaller in comparison. But it's about giving each club at every level the same level of support. So if there's individuals, and we do have uh, groups in League Two and League One, sometimes the clubs may not have the resources or the expertise to support those fans or those individuals. But that's why I think the FSA, the FA, the EFL, we can all play a part because ultimately there are fan groups all over the country. And if your club don't have the expertise, I think it's about contacting the EFL, contacting the FSA, speaking to other fan groups and say, how did you do it? Give me an example of best practice. What was your strategy? And it's about learning from each other. And one thing I think the LGBTQ plus community do so well, especially from a fan's perspective, is they do support each other. And like I said, so if you're a fan of a smaller club and you feel like you're not getting the, the support that you need, it's about contacting those external individuals. And, you know, Cheltenham's a great example. The launch is on the weekend and I've been working with Sam and Jenny to, to make this happen. And it's a couple of individuals, really, but hopefully that can grow to be like a rainbow base, to be like a proud balance. But you've got to start somewhere. So, you know, Jenny, who sent in that question. Yes. You've been working with them. <laughs> See, this, this man, I told you at the beginning, constantly working, uh, constantly to, to enforce change. Um, we've got some more questions uh, as well. Um, one question from Anne-Marie Godfrey. What are your recommendations for how to respond to people who are anti the campaign or don't appear to understand just how important it is? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it's it, it's always frustrating, particularly when uh, a positive campaign like Rainbow Laces comes about. And you see so many clubs, you see so many organisations getting behind it uh, in many different ways. And naturally, what always comes is uh, a lot of negative comments as well. Um, but what I, what I try and kind of encourage people to do is, is not necessarily focus too much on the negative, because uh, naturally, we will always find people, uh, whether it's uh, in the majority of cases, it's always a loud minority. Um, so again, like I, I try to encourage people, to, uh, particularly people that might get nervous about some of that negative comments. Um, I talk about the movable middle. Um, so the movable middle, a lot of the people who, 
who might not might feel a bit indifferent to LGBT inclusion, um, but might actually be moved by some of the personal stories that the campaign actually brings out. Um, so I encourage people to continue doing that work, continue doing that work and, and not get too bogged down about some of the, uh, I guess, the minority of comments that will naturally always be negative. Um, and yes, yeah, so to try and drown out with positivity, try and drown out with uh, a lot of the amazing work that does continue to go on uh, throughout the campaign. Um, but yeah, I think that's what I, I try to encourage, but I understand it's always, it can be quite tricky. And Anwar, we've got another question for you. Can you tell us a little bit more about how the Fans for Diversity scheme works and, and the impact that it's had on EFL fan bases? Well, I'm, I'm really proud to, to lead the campaign, but I think the most important thing is that we have funding available. So all the groups that you see tap into our funding for the banners, the T-shirts, the events that, that you see in the stadiums. And we've, we've got that funding and it's available to all fans to do any form of pro-diversity activi activity. But from a fans for diversity perspective, I'd say over the last sort of you know six years, we've been responsible for literally hundreds, well, tens of thousands of people that are now watching live football that probably never felt comfortable before. We've done over 200 events and we're supporting fan groups on a daily basis. So it's those conversations that you, you need to have. And what people don't realize, a lot of football fans have got day jobs and supporting a fan group, working for a fan group is stuff they have to do above and beyond that. So I think the EFL, the FSA, Kick It Out, all these organizations, the FA, the work that we do is so important because fans do amazing work, but it's not, it's not a, they're not paid to do it. They're doing it because they're passionate about their club and they're passionate about the positive change. So I'm just trying to play a role in which I can facilitate that and help them along that journey because you know the rewards, as we've seen, are amazing. You know, to have that visibility and going back to your previous question, I think those conversations are necessary. If someone has an issue with the rainbow laces or other forms or campaigns, without this campaign, you won't even have that conversation. And I think sometimes it's about having that conversation because if I can sit down and have a conversation with someone about why I think it's important, some may never change their opinion, but one might. And for me, I think that's worthwhile. Yeah, incredible. Um, let's, let's go to our, to our final point then for, for both of you guys uh, before you get back for the Q&A later on in the show. Um, Jay, you have done so much work at Stonewall. How much has changed since that very first day you walked through the door to you being sat here now? Uh, yeah, I think it's it, it's actually quite uh, overwhelming sometimes, particularly when you uh, when you're a part of something from a distance. Then you get a great opportunity to be a part of part of it from the inside, and then you uh, I, I guess kind of yeah see it from both lenses. And what's been incredible actually is, is just the massive step change that you, not just Stonewall's organisation or the Rainbow Laces campaign has had, but but everybody that we're talking about, everybody who's been part of this kind of step change and. Uh, within the game or within within sport more broadly about um, these conversations are really important um, this visibility is really important um, and having sort of partners and, and, and organizations and clubs investing in campaigns like this investing in conversations like this um, working with their LGBT fan groups these have all been really really key and important people who have uh, who have kind of shifted this positive step change to kind of be, be in a better place to kind of share some of the powerful stories that we have, uh, highlight some of the amazing allies that we now have in the game. Um, and again, like I think it's, uh, it's, it's really overwhelming to see because I think it's, um, again, it's night and day compared to what these conversations we were having maybe five, ten years ago. Um, and again, like I, uh, we spoke about it earlier, but we don't think that um, someone coming out in the Premier League tomorrow isn't going to change the world. It, it's not going to change. It would be obviously incredibly important, but it, it's not going to solve homophobia or, or discrimination in the game. But it's, it would be a good signifier into kind of how far we've come. And um, I'm overly confident about the fact that the game is in a better place today to kind of show support and solidarity to anybody who might come out, um, as we've seen with Josh Cavallo uh, and others, um, than it was maybe five, ten years ago. Yeah, we'll talk a little bit about, about Josh and... Uh, his brave journey that he's been over the last few weeks. And talking about brave journeys, Anwar, before we, before we say goodbye to you for the, this particular part of the show, you know, you walked in as a British Asian many, many, many years ago. And y you look at the, the young lad that walked into that football environment when you were younger to then go on and become the first to, to captain a side in the EFL. And you look at your respective journey. How much, what was it like back then? And how much has changed over that period of time? Oh, it's, it's changed dramatically. In, in fact, you know, I have, I have two young sons now that want to play football. And if I think about what it was like when I was first getting into the game at grassroots and at academy level, it's, it's a scary place. Things you heard, things you saw, things you experienced was, 
was horrible. And, and, and I can see why a lot of people from the South Asian community would, wouldn't want to be part of that, which is why we see a lack of representation. But I think it's about seeing a positive aspect of everything. You know, football is what I wanted to do. And regardless of who I was, that, is, well, that was my dream and I wasn't going to stop at anything. But I think what that journey has given me is the ability now to, to realise that how can we change and, and what do we have to do to make change. But I think for me as an individual, I've had an amazing football journey, but working for Fans for Diversity and working with fans from underrepresented groups, the LGBTQ plus community, different faith groups, it's made me a better person. And I think I was well versed as a human being, having experienced football from an Asian, British Asian perspective. But even me, I've learned so much in the last six years and I would encourage any active player, anyone working for the governing bodies to really get involved in this space because it can improve you as a human being. And once you get an insight, into the cultural differences then becomes an element of respect for, for different people. And I think that is the fuel everyone needs to support positive change. Brilliant. I could sit and listen to both of you all night long, but this section has come to an end. Thank you so much to Jay and Anwar. Really great to see both of you here at our fans forum. Let's take a look now and a quick reminder really as to why we're here uh, and what this is all about. Football is for everyone. It has the power to unite and inspire us. We might support different teams, but we are all together against discrimination. We look up to our players. Taking the knee is a simple act, a peaceful act to oppose racism and discrimination. It's a personal choice. And whether a player takes the knee or chooses to challenge in other ways, we must support and respect them. Prejudice and abuse, whether in the street, in the stadium, or online, has no place in society. Football is a game of many opinions, but there is one on which we should all agree. Racism and discrimination must be removed from our game. And those who do not agree are not welcome, because we are all together against discrimination. A strong message there that the EFL are together against all forms of discrimination. So welcome back to the EFL's first ever LGBTQ plus fans forum live from our studios here in London with me, Mark McAdam. And joining me once again is David McArdle, who is the head of the EFL's equality, diversity and inclusion work. Um, we teased you right at the top of the show, David. Great to see you once again. We can now go into the, the sort of nuts and bolts of, of the work you do. And, and uh, of course, as we said earlier, you've only been in the job for a month after many years at the Scottish FA. So, so how impressed have you been with what you've seen so far? And how excited are you about the journey ahead? I think just tonight, you can't help but be inspired. This is an inspirational evening that we've heard from some fantastic guests and some fantastic stories that we've had. But that's just the tip of what the EFL has to offer. There is countless amount of activities, events, people who are driving this game forward. And it's just a phenomenal opportunity that we have being 72 clubs, being the length and breadth of England and Wales to really make a change, to make that not just sustainable change, but effective change that's going to just make the game so much better for all. Absolutely. And remember, I've been saying it throughout the course of this evening. Uh, this evening, you can get in touch as well. We've got a question and answer session with all of our panellists later on today. So if you do have a question for David or for anyone else and you want that to be posed to them by myself, make sure you uh, get in contact with us via the social media channels as well so we can ask some of those questions. Um, we have got a question. We have got a few questions, David, so I'm going to put you in the hot seat now. Um, and this one is from uh, Jordan. He says, I'm a Dons fan. Why is the punishment so lenient for discrimination against the LGBT plus community? Well, I probably think, when you look at that question, obviously if it's on the field and it's a player, the, the FA kind of take, take control of that. If it's within the stands, then that's the clubs who are responsible to to, to look at that. Now, we've been very firm in the EFL with the tackling against discrimination. And we did that in a very real reason because we see them all as being equal. We see them all the challenges and that's why it was together against discrimination. So what we'll do is we'll work with our clubs to make sure that they get the better processes of identifying individuals, working out who they are, 
educating stewards, educating the club so they understand the different forms of terminology which constantly changes and they're not everybody's fully aware of. And then coming with a consistent approach of how they then identify and deal with anybody who uses a form of discrimination and any discrimination in the same way because we don't want to see it in our game. We do not want to see it within the EFL and we've been very firm in that message and so is all our clubs. That was from Jordan, who's a Dons fan. Um, to talk a little bit about the work that's being done. In the EFL, of course, 72 clubs, how many of those clubs have actively gone out to do work for this year's Rainbow Laces campaign? Well, as the EFL, we sent out the information to all 72 clubs and, and probably the last time I checked, majority of them have, have, are activated in that information. We sent out media assets, we sent out stuff they can use on social media, the substitute boards, all these aspects and, the, and made sure that they were fully aware of what the message was and how to use that appropriately. But what's the biggest thing is the amount of clubs who've went above and beyond that. We've seen some of the stories today about clubs who've went and created merchandise, clubs who've done above and beyond the, the, the laces or the armband, who've actually tried to make that difference, not just so it's a sound bite on a game on a Saturday, but it's actually making the change to encourage more people to have conversations, to be educated and really be those allies that allows our game to be inclusive because it's a wonderful game. Everybody loves football. Everybody should have the opportunity to be involved in it. And that's one thing that we need to make sure happens. Definitely. Uh, and it, you know what the great thing is here? I can sit here and, and interact with so many different fans from up and down uh, the EFL pyramid. We've had Charlton Athletic fans get in touch, Plymouth fans get in touch, Wimbledon fans get in touch, Ipswich fans get in touch. Uh, evening all, Jane here. I chair the Diversity and Inclusion Working Group at AFC Wimbledon and the Dons Trust. Uh, so big hello to Jane, who's watching probably from the comforts of her own home. Uh, big uh, hello and uh, good evening to everyone. Uh, this is Karis here from Proud Swans and the Rainbow Wall. What a fantastic event. Uh, evening all. Uh, evening to Jane and Ryan and here too uh, I'm the founder of the proud Shrewsbury Town LGBTQ plus fans and allies group and Rob has also got in touch. He is a uh, proud Valiant, which is, of course, Charlton Athletics LGBT fans group as well. So it's, it genuinely is great to see so many different people interacting with us throughout the course of this evening. Um, let's go back to some of the, the questions that have been sent in as well, David. And how far do you think football has come when it comes to the rate of um, kind of diversifying the game generally? We've seen through a number of years and, and very recently that our fan base is diversifying. We're seeing more fans access the game. And one of the main reasons for this is because of the diverse fan groups that have been created across the different focuses of community. But we're still needing to do more. We can't just think that we're getting better. We need to make sure that we get better. And using the information from some of these founders of these LGBTQ plus fan groups and other diverse fan groups around the country is how can we harness that knowledge, that experience, so we can tell how other clubs can do it, how they can share, how they can come up with ideas, because we're all one big community. We're all just trying to make sure that people can watch a game of football and feel safe and feel welcomed, so we can just have that commonality of football is what we really want to see. And we at the EFL are committed to continue these conversations, to listen as much as we can, so we understand fully the challenges and the way forward that these individuals and the communities want to happen. And we will then look to put that in place through our EDI and i strategy. And some of the, the comments and questions that are coming in, it, obviously about retrospective action. How do you take action against homophobic abuse? How do you take action against those people that make comments on a match day and make people feel unsafe? And how important is it that strict action happens? Well, I think we, we've been very clear in the fact that we don't want that type of language that we need to make sure that clubs understand how to deal with it, that we can support the clubs in the best way and how they can then take that message and make it as firm as they can within their own environment so their fans understand it because it's coming from their club's voice. And we'll do that through education, we'll do that through support, we'll do that through, as we said, listening and, and taking action as best we can. But we don't want that part of our game. It's not got a place in football in today's society and it's one thing that we need to ensure as part of our movement forward that it's just not there anymore. And that's going to be a challenge. It's not going to be easy, but it's something we need to continue developing. Some great questions. I tell you, there's some, some definite journalists <laughs> out there. They're putting you on the spot like a politician. Um, let's look forward now. Yeah. In, in five years' time, hopefully you're still very much at the heart of the EFL organisation. 
Um, what, what can you do to enforce change and how will you get there? What will this look like in five years' time? Yeah. We are in the process, just as we said, four weeks in the job, and it's four weeks where I've learned a lot across this game, and we've seen some fantastic work. So we're in the process of creating our first EDNI strategy, which will set the tone, not just for the EFL as an organisation, but for our clubs as well, and the community trusts that's out there, that we ultimately want our game to be representative and reflective of the communities in which we serve. So that's what we want. We, when we look at a football stadium, we want to see a diverseness. When we look at club boards, we want to see diverse. When we look at players, we want to see diversity. That's what we want to see in five years' time. Now, what we will do as part of that commitment is take that down a further level. We will create a series of action plans related to specific areas of the game. So we're not just speaking broadly. We're going to be speaking about the communities, for the communities, so they can see exactly what we're going to try and do to benefit them. And that will all be done through consultation because me and the team at the EFL, we don't know what it's really like out there in the fans. We need to be consulting with them as much as we can, consulting with the clubs, the community trusts, so it's effective and sustainable change throughout. I get the impression this, that this, for you, isn't just a job. This is a passion. This is something that you are desperate to see changed in your tenure whilst you're at the EFL. Yeah, I've had a lot from football. I, I was, a, I was a, a, a grassroots player, played at academy level, been a fan. I love the game. The game is a massive part of my life and it actually hurts when you see that people don't have that. When I look at people who want to be part of the game but feel the game's not part of them, it, it, it's actually, it, it kind of brings a passion to say, well, this is a game for everyone. We stand up and say that so many times in the game. How can we actually make it happen? <clears throat> How can we make sure that every young child, every person who wants to access football gets that opportunity to just get some of the experiences that I had that changed my life, that's brought my life into a career that I could never imagine? That should be everybody has that opportunity, not just the lucky few. David, great to listen to your thoughts there. Thank you so much. It sounds like you're going to be very busy indeed. Don't forget that we really want to hear from you as well this evening. So please do keep getting in touch. So for the final part of this special programme at the heart of London, I'd like to welcome back James, Catherine, Daniel, Lou, Jay, Anwar and David McArdle. I promise I remembered that. Um, thank you so much for your time this evening. We'll, we'll get straight into the Q&A because there's been some fascinating questions that have come through to us. Um, and Jane has said this, it's great to have a forum like this, which it is, of course. Thank you so much for hosting. The elephant in the room is that there isn't a single out men's player in the EFL. Josh Cavallo of Adelaide United, as we know, came out publicly in October. Why do you think there are no out players in the EFL? I'll take that one, uh, Mark. And, and first and foremost, I think Josh was incredibly brave in what he did and should be supported and, and given all the admiration that he had. And that was a very personal and private decision that Josh, Josh clearly made and, and, and felt he was supported. Now, is it going to be a target of the EFL that in five years' time we have an openly gay player in, in the EFL? No, it's not. It's not going to be something that we are aiming to achieve because it's very personal and we can't 
we can't fathom what that must be going through for somebody. But what we need to ensure that the culture and the environment is correct, that the support mechanisms are there. So if a player ever does choose to come out, that, they are, that everything's in place for them to be supported and to be welcomed and to have that in place. Now, we're getting there. Uh, I think we're in a culture now where ch certainly changing rooms would embrace it. They're, I don't see that being a problem. But how can we make sure that when players, a player does choose to do it, that they feel that it's something that they can be and be their true self and be what and be the way that they want to live their life and not hide that, which is something that we want to try and aim to do. So really it's getting making sure the culture and the environment and the support mechanisms are there and that's going to be your target within the EFL. The culture is definitely changing. Jay, you're at the heart of dressing rooms, or you know, with the, the football teams that you've been associated with. Does it very much feel like it's important that the message is this isn't just about getting players to come out, this is about the culture and, and everyone connected to the game just feels so much more comfortable in themselves if they do decide they want to be open about their sexuality. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's that's spot on. I think uh, we talk about allyship in a lot of ways and uh, what allyship might look like in football uh, might be uh, something which is already familiar to a lot of players. Uh, but sometimes when you approach them and, and you say, oh, what does allyship look like to you? Um, it can come to sometimes feel a bit disconnected, but but ultimately all players, particularly no matter what dressing you're in, everybody knows what a good teammate look like, looks like. And it doesn't matter whether someone is LGBT, uh, whether they're struggling with mental health uh, or any other personal issues, everybody knows what it looks like to support a player or to support a teammate. Uh, and in particular, locker rooms and dressing rooms up and down the country have leaders in it. Um, and they all know what it looks like to be a good teammate. So that's. Uh, I think uh, an important uh, sort of way we can kind of really ensure that people don't feel necessarily daunted by the idea of being an ally, but but ultimately just being a good teammate. And Jay, while I've put you on the spot, I've got another question for you as well from Susan, who says, do you think Coronation Street covered the story of a resident who was a player for the local team as a football player coming out after being told not to do so by the club? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I don't watch Corey. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so. Who watches Corey? <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> But I do know that they, uh, the way that they went about actually producing that story was the right way. Uh, I think it's important to share these stories, in particular the kind of representation that that story would have given uh, to LGBT people everywhere would have been incredibly powerful. Particularly, uh, I know Corey has a, a very staunch fan base, uh, so people have been watching Corey for years, and, and the kind of people that that story would have reached uh, would have been incredibly impactful. Uh, and I, I believe in sort of sharing stories, uh, particularly authentic stories like that. It's, it's important that it's done authentically. And I do know that they reached out to LGBT people uh, in kind of developing that storyline. Uh, and I know the actor himself uh, had conversations with LGBT people before uh, playing that role. And, and I think that's a really authentic and, and genuine way about going, uh, going about sharing those sort of stories. Right, James uh, and Dan, I'll ask this next question to, to both of you. Uh, this is from Michael. Uh, I'm working with Luton Town Football Club to create an LGBTQ plus supporters group. Uh, can you give me any advice, help? and guidance, uh, anything you can direct him into doing, and what are the key first steps? We'll start with you, James. Yeah, firstly, amazing. That's fantastic to hear. Um, kind of the journey that I went on was getting in touch with your community foundation at your club, and also if you've got a club engagement manager or an ED&I manager, getting in touch with them, dropping them an email, email, getting your foot in the door, and trying to have a sit-down meeting with them, either in person or over Zoom, and just talking about your ideas, what you want to achieve from that supporters group. Um, you know, get in touch as well with other supporter groups up and down the country. That's what I did. I had no idea what to do when I set Rainbow Blade, so I got in touch with the likes of Villa and Proud and Proud Baggies, um, getting in touch with Pride in Football as well. They've got tools in place, they've got resources. Uh, they've got toolkits that'll be able to help and guide you in terms of like the paperwork you've got to put in, in, in place. Um, getting in touch with Anwar, <laughs> of course. How can I, I, I obviously did not forget you. Because uh, I um, you know, spoke to Anwar, he gave me you know, loads of advice on what to do to get Rainbow Blades off the ground. So there is so there's a whole network of people out there to speak to. So speak to them, get that advice, and then yeah, get your foot in the door with the club and off you go, you're flying. You're flying. <laughs> Dan, tell us a little bit about your advice and, and what they should be looking to do. Yeah, indeed, I think James has given a perfect answer, if I'm totally honest, but I think <laughs> from, from, a, from a CCO perspective, so club community organisation, um, they often are the conduit in terms of between club and some, some fan groups. So actually, I think it's a really great start to, to start with a local um, community trust uh, and, and that's the route to go in and then things should flourish there. I think, to be honest, there is such a great network of EFL trust uh, CCOs, but also fans, support groups, 
groups as well. So um, if anyone needs any support on that, I think it's just pick up the phone to another local club and, and I'm sure they'll be happy to share some, some information, some best practice. Fantastic. We've got another question. Uh, this one from Robbie. Uh, he says, evening all. Uh, Robbie yeah, Minchin from the Leighton Orient Football Club Community Department. Uh, for any Leighton Orient fans, the club would like to say, watch this space because we are, as a club, looking at how we can improve upon measures in place to make all LGBTQ fans feel welcome uh, within our great club. So, Lou, that's fantastic. You know, Robbie Minchin from the Leighton Orient uh, Football Club Community Department saying, watch this space. Uh, and that's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, I've worked closely with Leighton Orient for many years and, and Neil, who heads up the trust there, um, is, is really supportive and works really closely with the, with the club. I think James has mentioned earlier, and, and as Dan has said, you know, sometimes it's perhaps easier to start off with a community trust as a charitable organisation, perhaps a little bit easier for them to, to work with diverse groups as, as a start, but their connection with the club, um, you know, really helps the club, you know, to, to drive it through. So, yeah, hats off to, to Leighton Orient and, to, you know, to all the staff there. They've always been, you know, in terms of the whole equality and diversity agenda, really be re really forward thinking there. So, yeah, thumbs up from me. Make sure you keep the questions coming in because we are still on air for some time yet. Um, we've had uh, something, this is quite amazing, from someone who's watching from Brazil. Uh, so, uh, Anwar, I'll let you start with this one. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Rafael Rocha from Brazil here. Congratulations on this amazing event. My question is about how to start a movement around here. Almost every football match we hear phobic, homophobic abuse here. Clubs and league do not do anything big like the Rainbow Laces campaign. How can we start as a small group of people to try and change the face of Brazilian football? I think it's an absolutely great question. I think sometimes we need to take stock because I think here we do do amazing work. Mm -hmm. With the FSA, when I first joined, I was going around uh, watching England uh, playing abroad and I had the opportunity to go and, and see what different football associations do. And they are in awe of what we do around equality. And I think sometimes people, I think we sometimes take that for granted. But for me, it's about starting something, looking at uh, examples of best practice and even starting something small. People do not realise how powerful a Twitter account can be or an Instagram account can be if it's done well. And one thing that he should know is that whatever they do over there, they'll have the support from all the LGBTQ plus fan groups in the UK straight away. So you've already got a network of, of, of people to support. So start it and have a presence. And the best way to do that in, in the modern age is, is online. Rafael Rocha there watching in Brazil. Uh, great advice from, from Anwar. But I think all of you will be able to testify there was always someone that started something first. And it just takes one person to start a movement and, and that's where things can happen. Uh, we've got another question uh, now, David, which I'll pose to you. Uh, are there plans in place at uh, club levels and at league levels to support any players who may be LGBTQ plus or may look to come out in the future? Of course. Yeah, if, if a player ever went to their club or a coach or anybody and, and kind of had that conversation, they will be supported. That, that, that's, not a, that's not any issue at all. They will be supported through even the club and how they deal with the media in sense of that or how the player can be supporting their mental well-being and going through that and how we can take that, that care. First and foremost, it's about the care of the player and how we can do that. And the club and the player and, and everybody around that environment will be supported in the best way can. And I think what we're kind of taking on from the Brazil comment, we as the EFL and as, as the UK can be a beacon of best practice. Just by doing this tonight is maybe set that little bit of a fire in somebody in Brazil to try and make that fundamental change. And we shouldn't be scared of shouting out the good work that we do uh, because we do a lot of good work across the UK and especially within the EFL. So we should be using that, that power of football. That, because when football speaks, ultimately people listen not just in the UK, but around the world. So we need to be that one where we challenge other countries. We challenge FIFA, UEFA to implement some of the best practice that we do in the UK and then within the EFL to make that change around Europe. So when we do go away with our national teams, that we don't hear some of the, the language and some of the, the chants that's used, then we can really challenge that as best way possible. And that's something, Catherine, you said earlier on about the work that the proud Swans have done and Swansea City Football Club is that you've seen a, a real tangible change from, from the work that's been done within your fans group. 
Yeah, definitely. And I think um, we were speaking in the green room earlier on. And if you've got the, the drive and the passion and it comes from the supporters, but from the clubs, community trusts as well, and other organisations such as what Anne was connected to, um, there is that drive, that, there's that determination out there and people are w wanting to work towards that same goal. Um, and providing you communicate and respect each other, you're going to get there. You're going to get there, but realise that change isn't going to be overnight. It's a gradual thing, but for sustainability, um, it has to be gradual as well. So don't expect changes to be immediate, but just something that you can just build upon. Lou, question for you from Leslie, who sent this one in, and she says, how are you supporting clubs when they are facing fans with homophobia? Um, might have to throw this one back to Dave, actually. Cause in <laughs> I don't want to keep chucking you know, it to no, Dave. I was trying to smooth it around. I appreciate that. Um, I think, you know, as we said before, working with our, our community trust, it, there's very much, and you asked before about education, and I think, you know, I'm a, a real believer that at times uh, that sort of like fear factor, that not knowing, um, is, is really something that causes that prejudice. Um, and so it, it really starts with, you know, the community trust can really start that education piece. Um, and I said that can move gradually, you know, or, or however quickly into the club and create that, that environment. So, you know, it, it is difficult. We don't want to see prejudice. We know it happens. Um, but, you know, it, it's that approach to really educate people and, and to make them understand that, you know, we've said a number of people on, you know, on, on the here tonight have just said it, it's just really football is for everybody you know and, and that's you know why why shouldn't it be and you know why why be you know discriminatory against anybody so it, it, it's we know it's it's a long job it's you know we're in it for, for the long haul but there's there's progress being made Rob Harris uh, has sent in uh, another question he says this has been great so well done to, to all of you he does watch Corey, incidentally, <laughs> unlike you lot. Uh, and he says he thinks it was handled really well. Uh, we talk about education, which is something you just touched upon there. Lou, how do you think you can educate on mass, for example, mass offensive chanting? That can be a hate crime uh, on a mass basis. Uh, Rob uh, Harris, who is a proud valiant, who we've heard from earlier on as well. I guess, David, I don't mean to chuck you uh, in at the deep end, but, you know, he has a really valid point there. When, when you've got... 500 people in a stand chanting homophobic abuse. What can the EFL do about it? And, that, and we are on a journey. Now, now there's things that we still want to improve upon, and that is certainly one thing that we want to see. And, and I think it's getting less and less in the game. Obviously, the FA have their rules in place when it comes to this mass chanting that they'll put kind of structures and, and, and aspects into the clubs. And the EFL are there to support. Any club can contact the inclusion team and ask for support in regards to creating an action plan. What's their advice? How can we try and deal with it? How can we educate fans on a greater basis? And we are in the process of looking at that and seeing what we can put in place so it's effective and sustainable change. There's no way we're ever going to get 500 fans sitting in a room as we educate them. So how can we make that a bit easier through e-learning, through the season ticket renewal, through all these other aspects that we're looking to try and put an offer to our clubs so they can just have that opportunity to try and make that change. But certainly, <clears throat> I think we talk about allies. If somebody's sitting beside you who's making homophobic language, whatever that may be, speak to them. Or a lot of clubs now have tech services. Email your club after the game and inform them of ad abuse that's happened because all these single chants start with one person and then it grows. So if we can sort it at the source, if we can challenge it at the source, if we can make our clubs aware of it, then that person can be dealt with. Because again, as we've said before, we don't want them in the stadiums. If they want to use discriminatory abuse, we don't want them in football. And, and, and Together Against Discrimination is very clear about that. If I can just add about allies as well, through the, the Proud Allies initiative that we launched that I was talking about earlier, some of the things that we got, um, well, we didn't get, they just did. Uh, Chef United fans were pledging on social media and we had a, a pledge graphic and they were pledging that there would be a Proud Ally uh, to all LGBTQ plus blades and we had lots of different uh, Sheffield United fans, fan groups pledge uh, and because of that it kind of then started to build that movement and it, just like you know we, we empower our LGBTQ plus fans we're also empowering our allies as well to stand up and be a voice and make a difference in the stands so I think you know that message about allyship is so so crucially important and getting the clubs on board with that as well we we put together this proud allies uh film uh and not only was it put through the rainbow blade social media accounts 
our, our club also posted it on their social media accounts and let's be honest, Chef United have a much bigger reach <laughs> than the Rainbow Blade social media accounts do. So, you know, that got to all the corners of the world um, and that is a proud allies film and everyone being an ally at Chef United. And, you know, I think that's really, really important to, to start to make this, this change. Can I just add to that? Because yeah. I think that is uh, something I'd always recommend. So if you're going to start a group, if you're within a group, at any club, you've got some real prominent fan groups at your club. So if we're talking about the bigger clubs, you know, your traditional fan groups could have an amazing reach on social media. They can have some real prominent fans. Get them involved in what you're doing as well. So that, that relationship with the club is, is really important, but also actually get to know your fellow supporter groups, your fellow fans, because when the Rainbow Blades do something, to have other Sheffield United fan groups, which I've seen support, that's, that's, that's for me, that's what it's all about because it's not a fan group working in isolation to fly the flag for diversity. It's actually all Sheffield United fans supporting a group for the same cause. So for me, in terms of best practice, it's get to know the clubs, but also get to know your fan base because you will have supporters within that fan base. I totally agree. Really, really good point, Anwar. Um, Jay, we've got a question. Uh, what can football learn from other sports or other industries? Clearly, you work at the FA, which is about football, but they tap into so many other sporting organisations as well, don't they? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, yeah, <laughs> sometimes I feel like football does get a bit of a bad rap. Um, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes for bad reasons. But, uh, but ultimately, I think actually there's a lot, and this is a great example of it, there's a lot that football is doing well. And I think probably sport is a as a wide collective, we probably don't learn en enough about each other. Um, and I think actually the Rainbow Lasers campaign is a great example of actually how, um, how that has actually had a positive effect of, of sports sort of learning of, of each other and kind of using the, the campaign as a, as a way to kind of uh, show who could be the biggest ally, show who, who, uh, who's doing the work all year round on LGBT inclusion. Um, and I think that's a really positive thing, and, and the campaigns like this do give the uh, sports an opportunity to, uh, to I guess, compete against each other and, um, and yeah, learn and, and, and grow, and, and again, like provide um, that really important visibility to the campaign that is, is, is so crucial. So um, again, yeah, I think every single sport has their, their own challenges. Um, there's a lot that rugby does well, that uh, football actually does well. And, um, so yeah, I think there can be loads of lessons uh, on either side. But yeah, I, I think what, what frustrates me sometimes is, is the narrative around football kind of um, being kind of the, a bastion for homophobia or, or biphobia or transphobia. Actually, uh, we do know that uh, home, uh, all this anti-LGBT language and abuse exists uh, across all sports and football actually does quite, quite a great job considering. Yeah, I think um, that's really key and, and Jay said we over consume football in this country, which is fantastic because it gives us an opportunity to make the difference. And it's what I said before, when football speaks, people ultimately listen maybe more than what some other sports do on a regular basis. Every single weekend, nearly three, over 300,000 people attend an EFL match live and countless others are on it on the screen. So the message that we put out can really be important and it's, it's also then vital that we do look at what other sports do, what other countries do, because we can learn, we can change. Maybe changing a bit of the message allows us to maybe be more impactful, but certainly we, we consume the game to a great amount that's really an opportunity for us to make a massive difference in this game. Whilst you're on that point, there's a question that's come in from Matthew David who says, um, how, as a higher level football league, can the EFL influence the grassroots level where homophobic banter is far more prevalent than it is within EFL stadiums? It's education. It's education through what we put on the TV screens in terms of what, how our players are role models, how our clubs are role models, how we send that message out. But then it's education that we can have across society because what we do in a football environment within our trusts or within the stadiums is not just impacting and changing football, it changes society and it spreads that message vitally wide. So by doing that, it can then have an impact on the grassroots. And obviously with the FA, with their work mostly in, in the grassroots element, we will always be a supporter of how we can try and make that difference as collectively across the game and really challenge the behaviours. That question was from Matthew, who is a Rainbow Red, which is the Middlesbrough LGBTQ plus supporters uh, group. And just a quick reminding that a recording of tonight's show will be made available on social media as well. So we can uh, email all of the respective organisations that have been tuning in and watching and sending in questions tonight to give you your own copy of tonight's show. Um, back to some questions. Uh, this one for Catherine and Daniel. Can you envisage a time 
where we don't need campaigns? Um, I'd love to say yes. I would love to say yes, but I think human nature is um, that. I think that there's always going to be an element um, of it. But what Anna said in his segment is so long as we have the ability um, and the platform to talk about it and to educate and to continue to educate. Um, I too am raising two, two girls um, in the modern world and I, and I think the world that they're growing up in is very different from the world that I grew up in as well. Um, a lot of it is to do with, with terminology and what's acceptable and what's the norm, but to be able to talk openly about it. So I think, I think it'll always be there, but I think whilst we've got platforms like this um, and where we've got all the, all the good work, not just in football, but, but generally in the community, in, diff in different sporting sectors, um, I think it'll get less and less and, and actually it'll, it'll flip. And, um, and it, won't, it just won't be tolerated. And where you, the question that was asked earlier about where you have the mass chanting and things, I would like to think that it, we will get to a place um, in, in the foreseeable future um, where that kind of thing just will not exist. I think we will get to that place. Yeah, I totally agree. I think looking at football with, with such a global fan base, even just for the, for the EFL, for example, um, it'll, it'll be a real challenge to, to get to a point where there is no, no need for big campaigns like this. Um, but I do think we're on, a, we're on a journey and football's made some great progress. Um, going back to your earlier point about learning from other sports, I think sports like Formula One, being a big Formula One fan myself, as well as football, um, I think there are certain individuals like Sebastian Vettel who's come out recently um, as a real strong ally. I think more of that would be absolutely brilliant. You see Lewis Hamilton with a rainbow flag on his helmet um, last weekend as well. So, yeah, I think... The campaigns are really important, um, but I think purely because the, I think the global reach of the EFL um, will be a real challenge in terms of um, it's not just England or, or the UK um, that watch it and engage with sport, it is an international sport. So, um, And the UK and football in the UK is, is much further along than a lot of other nations, that's for sure. And Lewis Hamilton has worn the rainbow helmet twice. Yeah and won two races. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, just well, saying. Again, <laughs> uh, final question, I can't believe we're running out of time. Um, uh, David, let's uh, give this one to you. Uh, this is from Zoe, uh, and she says, what is the time scale for the EFL publishing its EDI strategy and specific action plans? Uh, and that's from Zoe, who's a HR manager and EDI lead at Huddersfield Town. So at this moment in time, we've got just about the first draft ready, we're in-house in, in the inclusion team, we've kind of came up with where we think we should go. Now, we're going to do a vast amount of consultation with fan groups, with clubs, with with partnership organisations to make sure that when we launch it, probably between the end of the season and the start of next season, that everybody understands where we want to go and they're, they've bought in to that process. The action plans will then come after that, probably very quickly after that, and we'll work again with organisations to identify where we can have as much impact as we can. But again, a lot of that will be built from the communities themselves. So when we do launch our LGBTQ plus action plan, it'll be after consultation with the fan group. So we understand what they want to see the difference being. What do they see the change that's needed in our game? <clears throat> and as the EFL, we can then start to implement that. So we have again their buy-in. So certainly over the next six months, probably we'll be picking up the phone to Huddersfield and asking them for their advice and what they think we should be. So again, when we launch it, it's from the clubs who have bought into it as well. And so we really want to just be that beacon of best class. We want to be the one when people look at ED and I across the world, they look at the EFL and they look at our clubs as being the ones that they want to mirror as much as we can and really be that sustainable change. I said that was the last question, but we've had so many questions. <laughs> I'm going to try and squeeze in another <laughs> one uh, because we do just have about uh, enough, to, enough time. Uh, Taylor Nelson, um, thank you for tonight all. Um, a Barrow fan here. How would you all recommend going about promoting LGBTQ plus equality on a game by game basis, uh, particularly outside of important campaigns like the Rainbow Laces? And how do we challenge the use of homophobic language, which is something we've, we've spoken about a little bit already, particularly language used through ignorance rather than intent to cause offence? And how do you recommend we educate these people? I just uh, visibility, I think, is an obvious one. Um, it's great that there are certain times of the year where there's a real emphasis on different aspects of, of discrimination, but there is no reasons why places like Barrow can't have continued visibility throughout the season. Even when the season's over, there's stuff you can do with your big stadiums that 
continually have that message in our stadiums around your stance and, and what your thoughts and feelings are towards um, diversity. So great place. I've, I've played there a few times, never won, um, <laughs> but it, you know, the boards, the, the, the programs, the walls, it's an opportunity to do some creative stuff to really send out a pro diversity message. And, you know, the EFL and all the partner organizations are there to support um, if, if they need help around what that message is. And I think really the, the, the final point, which anyone is free to make is that tonight, this has been driven by the EFL. This isn't from the fans, this is something that they're passionate about, hence why we're sat here in this beautiful studio in London and that gives a, a real symbolic um, ident as to what this means for them. It's important that we have these conversations, that we, that we get this fantastic eclectic mix of football fans all together to talk about these issues and to talk about the good things and the bad things and, and talk about how we can enforce change. But what it certainly feels like right now is that, that change is happening, change has happened and that this journey we're all on is going to end in a really positive way. Yeah, I think I think that's it. Sorry, it's it's a journey, and we will never complete this journey. We're, we'll go five years, three years, whatever the length the strategy becomes, and we'll then look at what's next. How can we take the journey even further? How can we get better? How can we ensure that we don't get complacent? That everything is continuously challenged. And we are at a, a turning point. We are at a point where the EFL and the partner organisations and the clubs are really seeing the opportunity for us to make this better, make the game better, really change what we want to see being our association, our game. And really, everybody on the panel tonight has been phenomenal in terms of the stories. And again, the stories are the tip of the iceberg. There's constant the amount of clubs we've heard from this evening who are telling similar stories. And what we need to do is take that collective message, knowledge, understanding, and make sure that every single club in the EFL has the opportunity to create diverse fan groups and they're supported to do it in that way. And that's something that really I want to see in our future. Perfect way to finish. And of course, you all go home with three points today because you've all been brilliant. Thank you so much to the team. James Laley, Catherine Thomas, Daniel White, Lou Brackpool, Jay Lamonius, Anwar Udin, and of course, David McArdle from the EFL. And of course, most importantly, thank you to everyone at home for joining us this evening for this very special first ever LGBTQ plus fans forum. Don't forget, Rainbow Laces Day is on Wednesday. Uh, so make sure you wear your laces on Wednesday and check out all of the EFL's social channels as well where you'll find uh, some behind the scenes content from tonight and loads, loads more. Uh, thank you so much to everyone for joining at home. Thank you for sending in your questions. Uh, it's been an absolutely fabulous night and I am honoured and privileged to have been sat here in the host seat. So thank you very much to the guys in the studio. Thank you to everyone at home and it's a big good night from all of us here in London.